Thank you.
you for coming down to today's event. I'm Zing from SG Innovate, and today we are very happy to collaborate with UNDP on our very first SDG Innovate event. At SG Innovate, we build and invest in deep tech startups to tackle hard problems from around the world. And part of these problems help in uh, help. Part of these startups help solve problems that will help contribute to the sustainable development goals. Today, our esteemed panel will be talking about how technology and can play a part in sustainability and in achieving all the sustainable development goals. Before I invite our special guest up to give his opening remarks, I would just like everyone to stand so we can take a wee fee shot of we finished out of the event because we have a very good full house today. So don't be shy, everyone, please stand up. Full house, everyone, ready? Please look in the middle. One, two, three, cheese and do some uh, casual shots, like maybe a peace sign or hey, one, two, three, cheese. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, everyone. So without further ado, uh, So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Bradley Busetto up on stage to, uh, to say a few words, please. Mr. Busetto, please. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. What a, indeed, what a fantastic turnout. Um, my name's Bradley. I'm with the new UNDP Center here for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development. Um, and we're super pleased to be here in partnership with, with Steve and, and the rest of his team at SG Innovate on this topic of tech for sustainability, um, not just tech for good, but tech for a sustainable world. Um, and I want I, just a couple of words um, about what UNDP is all about, and in fact, why we're here. Um, and then I'll turn it right over to our to our panel. Um, so you may or may not know, but UNDP, the UN Development Program, is the world's largest development organization. Um, we're present in 170 countries around the world, and the work we do is all about getting people out of poverty. Um, making sure that we push people out of exclusion and and we reduce income inequalities like big really big picture stuff and really tough work in, in in many countries around the world so you might be asking then so why in the world are is UNDP here in Singapore um, it is really unusual um, but we're here because we think there's an amazing amazing opportunity and an amazing promise um, and and we think that the the promise is is to is to link this incredibly vi vibrant technology and innovation ecosystems uh, here in Singapore with the rest of the developing world to to help identify and sometimes co-create co-design solutions here in Singapore for the rest of the developing world. Um, we think Singapore is ready for that, ready to to become a global capital um, for sustainability solutions and sustainable development. So that's the really big ambition, um, and we think we can really achieve that if we can do that in partnership with, with folks like SG Innovate and, and all of you folks here. Um, so we really urge you to, to connect with us. Um, so just a, 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 a little sense of what we're initially focusing on. We're very much still in startup phase and startup mode, but we've identified the three initial areas in which we want to, to work where we think Singapore is already world leading or will soon be world leading um, and those areas around um, sustainable finance obviously with the massive fintech scene here and the, the already very robust um, finance sector here um, another is around sustainable agriculture and agri-tech and that makes a lot of sense i think too with um, with the the government's new commitment now um, on, on the future of food here in singapore and beyond um, and the third area is around digitalization in cities and, and urban areas. And we, we've picked these areas not just because Singapore is really good at them, or we think we'll soon be very, very good at them, but, but because all of these issues, all, all these topic areas are super, super relevant to, to the developing world, to, 
to new cities, new mega cities in Africa, to, to the, the problems of rural farmers in, in Africa or remote areas of, of Asia. So that's the idea. And the idea is to, you know, to work out here with, with all of you interested folks how we build this, um, this tech for sustainability community in Singapore and beyond. And then how do we, you know, what are the mechanics of, of linking up Singapore with um, the rest of the world in this way? Um, it could be through new technologies identified here. It could be adapting already known technologies for the developing world. Um, it could be any number of, of, of things. And we think that with UNDP's global presence, our sort of neutral brokering role um, as the United Nations, uh, so sort of shepherding role of the sustainable development goals, and I think a new development that's really relevant and really pragmatically important is that we've recently launched, too, um, a global network of, of innovation labs in 60 countries, um, 60 developing countries around the world. It will be soon the, the world's largest network of, of innovation labs, and we want to figure out great ways to link Singapore, all of you folks, up to, to these innovation labs to, to do good work um, across the world, not just here in, in, in Singapore. So with, with that, super excited. This is just the launch event. Um, expect much more to come and look forward to a really robust discussion about um, these tough challenges, but exciting, exciting opportunities too, I think. And thanks again to, to our esteemed panelists too. Okay, thanks Bradley, and uh, what I'm going to do is get us going here because we have a lot to cover. Thank you everybody for being involved. Uh, just to reflect briefly, SG Innovate exists for one purpose, and that's to try and work with deeply technical or entrepreneurial scientists, depending on how you'd like to describe it. We want to build companies that go on to have an impact far beyond Singapore. We invest, we help find talent, we help find customers. So it's pretty straightforward. And we want to try and talk about difficult topics that get us thinking. It's not our goal to try and say this is the right answer because there may not be a specific answer, but we ask that you be engaged. And so we have Slido or we have the raise your hand and we'll try and get a mic to you or stand up and shout your question. But it's going to be a function of how involved and engaged you are with the panel that uh, we've been able to pull together with teammates from UNDP. So with uh, no further ado, what I'll do is uh, invite Beth and Robin and Atsushi to join me on stage, please, and let's get going. Okay, um, what I'm gonna do is go down the line and everybody will have a chance to introduce themselves in their own words, but I wanted to make sure that we put the sustainable development goals on the screen behind you, because for those that may not know, these are the SDGs, and we've spent a lot of time exploring parts of them. We've had events when we talked about the role of a digital identity as a proxy for a legal identity for the billion plus people that don't have a legal identity around the world, especially in refugee and conflict areas. So there's lots of things that we've tried to talk about along the way. Here's what these represent and why we're here to discuss the idea of technology and, and sustainability. So what I'm gonna do is just briefly set the stage. Uh, technology affects all of us every day. Uh, sometimes we think of it very simplistically as the smartphone and the latest mobile app, but the concrete, the steel, the electricity, the plumbing, everything that makes the building in which we're sitting possible is in itself a form of technology and of course throughout human history. So I'm a believer that technology will continue to play an important role and perhaps an even more important role, but we have to confront difficult questions. We have to think about the role of data and privacy. How do we think about the role of government? How do we think that we would have in terms of uh, priorities, are we willing to think of individual rights or societal rights? Is there one that has to take priority over the other when it comes to very difficult problems? So these are some of the things that we have to confront. But without AI, without med tech, without some of the technologies that are becoming increasingly prevalent, some of these really tough problems, I believe at least, are going to be not possible uh, to solve. So I'm an evangelist for why technology is important. 
recognizing that there are some inevitable difficulties that we have to work through. So with that in mind, I'll go just uh, down the side here and I'll ask uh, each person just to introduce themselves in the way that they would like to. So Atsushi, I'll start with you, please. Um, my name is Atsushi Taira. Um, how many of you guys know SoftBank? Okay, uh, actually I, I used to work for SoftBank under Masterson 12 years. And so uh, that was a single journey because uh, I was part of the big acquisition and also investment. And also I was in India for years uh, to see the mobile internet uh, expansion and also growth. And, and then um, that was a great experience, but uh, three years ago, I realized myself, am I happy to fight with um, competitors and try to beat you know, other guys to capture the market share of course, you know, monetary-wise, maybe interesting, and then return on investment-wise, very interesting, but I could not fulfill myself. That's why, at the same time, younger brother of Masterson, a Taizo-son, I, I, I knew him more than 10 years, and then he also felt like, um, mm, well, that kind of thing was very fun, but uh, nowadays, uh, we need to think about a different way, as more inclusive society, rather than just uh, try to win alone, and then try to beat them other people, right? And then we started a company called Misuto. Um, you know, Misuto is definitely a happy name, right? Um, it's a Christmas song, uh, Kissing Under Misuto. But if you look at the Misuto definition uh, in the internet, it says a kind of keystone species in the forest. So uh, my, my, our case, you know, uh, forest is a startup forest. So Misuto is very small species, but we want, we want to be sort of a keystone species for uh, supporting the startup ecosystem. That's why we st started. But uh, three years ago, we had no idea what to do. Um, but of course, you know, we like to be change maker or wave maker to make the world a better place. That was a very beginning starting point, but uh, we could not understand what to do. And then after maybe one year of the discussion, we set the nine sort of agenda, slightly different from SDG goals, but that's including uh, everything, including infrastructure, water, electricity, and also learning, and also healthcare, agriculture, food, and also uh, living space and things, something like that. But we have on our agenda for each of those, uh, which is maybe more sustainable, more distributed, more you know, uh, good for environment. And then we try to set up the uh, project uh, to show uh, hypothesis and uh, to prove the hypothesis. And then in order to uh, get the technology, obviously we need a startup uh, technology. That's why we use the uh, investment uh, to get uh, the technology from startup and also to meet with uh, like-minded people. So we do investment, but uh, it's more like uh, just a tool to see the uh, like-minded people and those like-minded startup uh, to change the world a uh, better place. So that's uh, Misuto. And I'm so excited to see this because uh, I believe also like uh, Steve, technology can be used for a much better uh, way. Of course, you know, at this moment, technology is uh, more like, uh, okay, compete with other companies and compete with the uh, uh, enemies, but you know, we need to think about how we can utilize technology to uh, inclusive and also uh, sustainable um, the manner. And it is possible if more people think that way. That's why I'm so passionate to be here because uh, at least you know, look at this, you know, full of people, many people are interested in that way. So uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you very much. I'll trade you. Uh, thank you very much, and I just want to thank Steve and the team from SG Innovate and Bradley and his team from UNDP for having me here. They caught me en route back from Australia, uh, well, on holiday here, but I'm delighted to be here. And I was in Australia very much to talk about what's going on there and what's going on in so many places around the world, which is the creeping crisis we're facing in democracy, with declining rates of trust in so many places that lack a functional government, and even in places like Australia or the US that have a competent government, where there is really a declining 
uh, trust in institutions. So my focus for many years has been on how can we use technology to, as a tool to make government work better, to enable us, to your point, to be able to do the kind of legitimate convening that really only government can do to answer some of those hard questions. So I hail from an organization called the Governance Lab. I am a professor in my day job, and I run the Governance Lab at NYU, and what we do, uh, we're based at NYU, also in Melbourne and in Madrid. And what we do is work with public sector institutions on the question of how we can use technology to make our institutions both more effective, but also more legitimate. And it's those twin goals that I think we have to meet and that technology can help us to do both of more effectively so that we can recognize the good ideas that you're talking about, so we can implement them, so we can scale them for greater good. Uh, so my, uh, my unfortunate day job is to get up every day and work with government, uh, um, and I am eternally either pessimistic or naive, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, and underpaid, um, but I'm very, but delighted to be here. Um, I really like the, uh, the bohemian look and feel of this place. Um, as I s walked in, this place feel like a global commons to me, uh, looking at the diversity uh, of the audience and the aroma of curiosity that's uh, permeating in this room as well. Uh, so I think it's a delight to be here. Uh, how many of you have you heard of the firm Tomasic? Well, that's almost as many as SoftBank. <laughs> um, Tomasic, I, I look after um, sustainability and stewardship uh, in Tomasic, uh, which is probably the youngest group uh, in the organization, which was formed maybe three and a half years ago. And I joined the organization two and a half years ago, after about one and a half decades uh, in the media. I'm still trying to wonder uh, what qualifies me to be in this particular role. Uh, therefore, it's just as well I'm here to uh, learn from this uh, very bohemian audience. Um, Tomasek, as you know, is an inter intergenerational investor. Uh, so we really exist for one and one purpose only, and that is to accumulate wealth for future generations of Singaporeans. Uh, so if you're not able to do that, then we really have a reason to exist. Uh, being, an international, being an intergenerational investor would mean that we must be, by nature, a sustainable investor, and we must invest in sustainability. Uh, because if the returns are not sustainable, if the businesses are not sustainable, and if sustainability is not at the forefront and not at the core of the company's product and services, then sustainability cannot be assured. And in the absence of sustainability ass assurance, then we are not able to perform our duty as an intergenerational investor. So for that reason, sustainability is what we believe in. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum because, Robin, you mentioned if something is not sustainable, then how does it continue? But we're in this sort of odd period of time right now where some of the most highly valued technology companies in the world are, by definition, not sustainable economically, right? So without mentioning any particular technology company, there are some that are about to go public where the prospectus basically says we have no visible path to profitability and yet they're worth tens of billions of dollars. These things affect humanity, right? Affect our very existence, affect our very ability to continue as societies. And yet we have a hard time getting venture capital for some of these very important initiatives, despite the fact that there seems to be venture capital in, in other areas. So I just would like to explore a little bit. I don't want to try and go down the line and say each person, but if there's somebody that would like to offer a perspective on this kind of oddity of highly valued, not seemingly sustainable companies, and yet there's a scarcity of venture capital for things that actually keep us all around on a future world. Uh, anybody want to tackle that one? Atsushi as an investor, or is that, am I putting you on the spot? Probably. <laughs> yeah, so as I mentioned, um, Masason ties us on quite interesting contrast. Masason is, of course, you know, as you know, recently formed $100 billion fund two. It's a crazy size to capture all unicorns in the world, right? 
Of course, nothing wrong. It's kind of capitalism logic. And he also said that you know he wants to make the world a better place, actually. And but Taizo is opposite side is very interesting. One family, it's a one side is a very extreme this side, and then Taizo is at the other side. Is he is more collaborator, he more partnership basis. Of course, money is important, but uh, you know money should be more circulated rather than inflated. So that concept is totally opposite. I have seen both sides. And then both are investors, right? Of course, you know, and then Masa is more, I, I have seen, you know, focus on IRR, right? Because uh, shorter term and then big return, on, you know, return, multiple. And then Taizo is actually a longer term. That's why, unfortunately, we could not get any um, LP investment. So our investment is driven by, uh, at this moment, his wealth. So it's quite limited. Right. Of course, you know, they're kind of big, but Masa side at $100 billion, and Taizo is much less. But I think uh, without LP, we have freedom. So we don't have any specific timing. Usually, if it is a venture capital, you need to get return five years, seven years, you know, less than 10 years. But we can wait more than 10 years. I think especially right now, to think about sustainability or SAT, I think we need to be more longer term, maybe more than 10 years or even 20 years return on investment. However, if we focus on big social impact, actually, naturally, return on investment would happen. So at least, you know, uh, we have under our portfolio companies, one or two are already unicorns, and then it could be uh, maybe 100 times multiple, and then that gives us a uh, big social positive impact, and also long-term return on investment. At least we have one case. That's why we believe, oh, it will happen, we don't need to copy massa model, but there's a, another way, but it uh, takes a long time. So that's why we need to be have a different structure versus current BC structures, for sure. Um, I have two boys working in, uh, in the tech industry, and one of them has a expensive education in NYU to thank for. Uh, so I'm neither going to knock uh, the university nor uh, the tech industry. Um, I think if you look at the tech industry as a whole, you'll find that it begs the question, where is the taxation system headed? Right? Uh, because these days, I, I think I no longer look at P&L or tech company, I only look at cash flows, I mean, uh, balance sheets, uh, because the value of the company isn't in the P&L. Uh, and we're not gonna change that, and that's just the way it has become. Um, and, and, and because they don't pay out a profit, they don't pay out a dividend, uh, in fact, Microsoft pay out dividend maybe a decade or decade and a half ago, and after that, it just the stock just tanked. Uh, maybe there's a story there. Um, so what does it tell us? Um, the traditional method of taxation, uh, which is a form of distribution uh, or wealth, uh, in the light of the tech world, uh, that has disrupted the traditional uh, businesses for which the taxation system were developed on, probably just doesn't work anymore. And uh, one wonders if some kind of a transaction tax might be called for and some um, cross-boundary transaction uh, consideration has to be contemplated some way. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that one out and see if smarter people might pick it up and, and ask the professor the question next. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, can never work the technology in an event about technology. This is classic. Um, so I was, you beat me to it because I was going to take the path of not laying the blame at the feet of business, but at least uh, laying some of it at the feet of government in the sense that uh, we have not historically been very good in government at collaborating with other sectors. We have very limited blunt tools at our disposal that we're seeing some change in, in terms of the development. Bradley mentioned the 60 innovation labs that UNDP is starting. One of the things that's exciting about that network is not only that it's creating these citizen-driven innovation hubs that will have a lot of startup, bottom-up activity, but that UNDP, through its convening power, is able to marshal the resources of government, both to define problems that people can solve and hopefully marshal additional investment resources. We've seen great innovation in the healthcare space where government uses its market power to create advanced market commitments, to say, if you develop the vaccine, we'll buy it, right? If you develop X, we'll do it. 
um, and where you see things like an X Prize or an innovation lab like a Citra in Finland or like an IXC, the DFAT uh, Australian Innovation Lab in their development agency, um, we're seeing those, some of those new models of governments that are really looking to work in new and more agile ways with the private sector to provide interesting funding mechanisms and to provide uh, collaboration mechanisms and above all, I think, to do that hard job of defining the problem. This is great, uh, but, you know, anyone, pick a number. These are pretty broad issues and it takes, I think, some help to really help to shape and define what the problem is and do that matchmaking between demand and supply and that's where government needs to do some of the heavy lifting in order to marshal what I think is a lot of goodwill that's out here wanting to do well by doing good. Beth, can you perhaps share a bit more on your thinking because this idea of crowdsourcing, I'll admit that I find it a struggle sometimes to think about difficult problems like what is the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare? Because my natural inclination is if we can assist doctors, let's say in this case computer vision to try and improve the speed and accuracy of diagnosis, not in place of but in support of some of the current workflow, that intellectually seems a good thing but then there's all the appropriate regulatory environment and data protection concerns and who's gonna pay for it and there's friction. So I struggle sometimes with, is it best thought of with a big group of people or a small group of people? And I know you've written on this concept of take a big problem, break it into smaller problems, reach out to appropriate experts. Can you share a bit more with the audience a bit of your thinking around this idea of citizen engagement and how governments can reach out to the brain trust that citizens represent? Sure, and I think it's not just governments in this case, it's all institutions, public, private, business, government. Um, so Steve is teeing up the point that when I originally asked to come, uh, I was asked, you know, will you talk about data? And I said, you know, n no, because everybody talks about it, everybody gets it, data, good, we all like data, it's wonderful. We don't know how to use it, we don't know how to deploy it, but I think that the most exciting technology or set of technologies that are available to us today are the technologies of collective intelligence. That's not one tool, and AI plays a very big role in this. It's a technology that collects, the, uh, that connects the brains in the room rather than just the data that's coming from the sensors. So it's the data that's coming from people, essentially. But there are very different models by which we do that. So to your point, there's the traditional crowdsourcing. I mean, crowdsourcing originally, when Jeff Howe coined the term back in 2005 in his Wired Magazine article, was about a large number of undifferentiated people guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar or the weight of the sheep at the fair. And mathematically, the law of large numbers teaches us that when you average out those people guessing the jelly beans in a jar, you arrive at a very precise answer. That is not the way, obviously, to do uh, brain surgery. Uh, I would not want to crowdsource brain surgery. Um, but I do want just to give you two quick count, uh, alternative examples. So one involving a larger group and one involving a smaller group. So when Samir Brahmchari, then the head of Science India, said we need to make progress against tuberculosis. It's a market failure. Investors don't want to invest in a drug that only affects poor people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and organize the crowd to uh, annotate the literature on the TB pathogen. And he had eventually 8,000 people, students from rural villages, professors, you name it, went through 27,000 articles. Long story short, within four years, they were in clinical trials on a new TB drug. Sorry, skipping, skipping the middle there. Um, at a very, very low cost. So a large number of people were needed to annotate 27,000 articles. On the other hand, fast forward to 2016, I got a call from the Inter-American Development Bank, said, do you know a smart professor who can help us solve Zika? I said, well, I know a lot of smart people and NYU is very expensive, but I don't know any one of them that can solve the crisis of Zika that was then ravaging Latin America. But I said, what I can do is use new technology to organize 100 people for you or 200 people for you. If we break it down into smaller problems and then we reach out to people, we can think about what those solutions are. So long story short, I think the, the crowdsourcing is a great shorthand citizen engagement, citizen science, open innovation has a lot of different terms, but it, it breaks down really into those projects that look like where a competition 
like the X Prize is a great way to get something done. A lot of things look more like Wikipedia. It's collaboration. It's a lot of people working on one thing. Or maybe it's co-creation. A lot of people developing a lot of different solutions. If we want to tackle climate change, we don't want one answer. What we need is a thousand really good answers and fast. So, I, so the big technology, the kind of single thing I really want to say is that the most important technology is the technology that connects our brains. So let me, let me push one more on this and then I'll move on. This idea of not having bias in that idea of crowdsourcing. So how do we try and get out of any one population? So if we're gonna think about the example that you shared with tuberculosis, which is a great example and there's already uh, lots of problems with um, antibiotic resistant malaria affecting different countries in Southeast Asia. How do we try and make sure that this brain trust is cross-cultural, cross-demographic. Have you seen that we've been able to get a large enough collection of brains in your various travels? Have we been able to achieve something that we would aspire to do more of? So I think you're, uh, let me say, I'm gonna take issue with one point and then agree with one point. So I think that there are, to your first point, these exercises, this convening of broader communities, these are design exercises. They are what we make of them. And if what's important is a large number of people and a great deal of diversity and a lot of different perspectives, then we need to engineer for that. That's the good part. And there are lots of great examples. The, the TB one is a great one because it was people all across India from all different socioeconomic uh, kind of levels, and especially leveraging students not from the elite universities, but from you know more remote, less privileged places, because they were the most hungry to participate. Um, but the issue I would take is that not every project, just as not every research experiment needs a randomized control trial or needs a representative sample. We have lots of great projects where it's about getting a small group of people who are from a particular place. So in Ghana, for example, it's one of many places they're practicing what's sometimes called social auditing. So they said, we're gonna get a community of people located in a place, or for example, in the state of Rajasthan in India, the group MKSS has done the same thing. We don't want a large number of people from anywhere. We want villagers from this community, as they do in MKSS, to listen, they can't read, to listen to the budget being read out loud and to identify that's a bridge being built to nowhere, that's a dead person on the payroll. It's a great example of using collective intelligence. It doesn't take a million people, it takes a few of the right people. Um, and thus the same thing with the Zika project. It's about finding 10, 20 people. So I think the point is that there are lots of different ways of organizing these things. Uh, and investors do a lot of the same thing when they reach out using their Rolodex already. So. Asushi, you've spoken about decentralization and distribution, and I know you and Mistletoe as a team are right. fans of sort of self-organizing sure. communities. Yeah. And how do we think about this idea of tackling tough problems, really tough, big, large, hairy problems, maybe breaking them down into smaller chunks, but how would we think of then a distributed, decentralized community like the ones you're fans of? Yeah, I, I think it's quite important because, for example, uh, Mississo used to be a corporation structure, but we uh, realized that corporate structure doesn't work because hierarchical and also uh, more boundaries over there. That's why uh, we are quickly shifting to community-based. Actually, we actually push out people to be independent. So we, we have zero employee, basically. Of course, uh, board members, but just a board member only. And the old people are actually independent. And then, of course, you know, need to have some contract. But because, you know, depend on the project, we need a different type of people. And then the organization should be dynamic. Otherwise, it is not possible to attack, you know, very complicated pro uh, problem. And also, we need a different type of the people suddenly. For example, oh, we need an AI expert. We need a bioprinting guy. So in that case, uh, we couldn't hire all those people. The only way will be creating community. And uh, it's more like an individual passion base, not sort of assignment basis. That's, we believe, it's very important because um, if people behave different way, right? If as a corporate person, need to follow corporate sort of a direction rules, of course, right? That's especially here, Singapore, it's very important to be part of the structure, right? N nothing wrong, but we cannot expect the innovation or a crazy idea from structured manner. 
And a crazy idea and also interesting idea will come up from an individual, right? The same person, corporate face, maybe not creating innovation, but uh, as an individual, the person will be very creative for something he's passionate about. So we try to create a passionate you know, uh, people network for certain agenda, either agriculture, food, or learning space. And then we are so uh, surprised, you know, the corporate world, you know, they're doing boring job maybe, but, uh, you know, after hours, being part of community is very creative, being part of us. And then actually we pay certain money, you know, to work together, of course. And then eventually the guy want to start the startup then we're gonna do angel investment, and eventually corporate guy change to the entrepreneur. So through the community activities, we like to see more such kind of, you know, supporting a passionate individual in conjunction with the uh, democratize the technologies. That's why we are so passionate about the supporting 3D printing, uh, bioprinting, or hardware, metal, whatever it is, because that's kind of technology will be available in digital level that they can try and test by themselves, no need to rely on the big corporation, right? That's why we are doing two things. One is a democratizing technology, many areas, many areas, and also forming community. And then in combination, we believe many interesting idea solution will come up. And then we're gonna support as investors. And also we like to work together with them to create a, some interesting solution and ideas. Are there questions? I've got some questions on Slido, but I always want to leave questions for old-fashioned technology. Yes. Yeah, we'll see if we can. It's going to be a little tricky to, I'd have to fling it to you, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for all the, the messages. It's actually a very important topic, and uh, the Prime Minister was talking about it during the National Day, the challenges of Singapore with climate change, and Singapore is a susceptible country because it's at sea level, and we don't know what's gonna happen if things get getting worse. Uh, I wanna ask about the last uh, uh, topic, which is motivation and passion. And I've, every time you were explaining how you wanna keep the talent, how you wanna have people with passion, I keep thinking about Tesla, 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 how Tesla has these people who join the company who are very strong individuals, so they know what they want, they're very talented, and then they leave. How do you manage to hire people who are not just motivated, but who are leaders? Because people who are leaders have their own ideas, have their own perspective of what should happen with the company, and that create conflicts. You cannot just have a group of motivated people. You need to guide them. So I wanna know if you, you guys can maybe share, how do you manage to not only get people with, with that motivation, but also good leaders who can change the perspective of all these projects for improvement. You don't want to start a project like this with a vision. You want to have it with a vision that can change and adapt. So I don't know if you can comment on that. How do you, how do you create or retain leaders or invite leaders to these groups? Asushi, do you want to try and tackle that one since you were just speaking? Your, your approach of network as opposed to sort of a formal hierarchical structure in a corporate environment, maybe one aspect. Yeah, so corporate world is good for repeating something, right? And then grow something the same way. That's of course a no brainer, that's the best format, right? I, I worked for corporate many years. But when we come to the sort of a changing moment or try to change the structure, uh, change the uh, some basic foundation, Corporate doesn't work because the corporate loves continuous same thing repeating to make money. Now, nothing wrong, that's good. But we are now, especially this theme, everything is try to change the course, right? And a change of course couldn't happen by corporation. And then that's, as of course it may be wrong, but that's our conclusion. Only community power can do that. But of course the community need a funding. That's why initially we get a fund by ourselves. But we are hoping that because of the some result, that would trigger other funding from somebody else. And then some startup will be successful. Maybe eventually, you know, unicorn and then exit. Maybe billionaire, they will be. Uh, we are hoping they will come back to us, do the same thing. So by doing so, I think a more private money can be circulated to be part of the, this kind of theme with community power. At this moment, 
that's only way to make it happen. And, and then once people see the success, of course, you know, many people want to follow and then support, right? But somebody need to start. Somebody need to be first dancer. That's why at this moment, we try to create a more fast dancer, and then we try to support such, such first dancers more and more. That would be maybe, uh, at this moment, my opinion. And then, as I mentioned, people need to have a two side. One is a, maybe a daily job, but also need to a role you know, after work to be part of this kind of you know, more meaningful, the future project. If you know, all corporate people can be part of this kind of project, I think that power is so huge. So that's why I try to push the uh, corporate, uh, especially Japan, for example, is very rigid. Most of the corporation um, don't allow after work job. But uh, you know, what if, okay, all corporate people can be part of the you know, socially meaningful, you know, sustainable goal project, you know, the road. Maybe it's a free up a lot of knowledge and also uh, maybe uh, ideas. I'm hoping that would happen. Maybe uh, from Singapore, maybe, you know? <laughs> well, let, let, let me try and, Beth and Robin, I want to ask a question that's come through on Slido and I'm gonna ask if you could help us disprove or debunk, right? Because the question is framed to some extent as how do we try and think of accepting lower returns when we're thinking about sustainability goals, projects? So I guess the question is, how do we think about accepting lower returns? But can I think of it, perhaps you'd like to offer a perspective, do we need to think of it? Meaning, are we on the wrong foot at the beginning to think that we must accept lower returns or can we in fact have no less an expectation for something that might be uh, a sustainably uh, oriented goal. Sure, happy to take that question. And uh, but maybe just before that, maybe in quick response to the gentleman over there, uh, if you have already hired someone and you try to find passion in him or her that wasn't there in the first place, I think you've just made a wrong hire. Um, I think I, I usually look for four cues the IQ, which I think is, is, is a more or less given, EQ, which probably we all know what that is, it's important, MQ, which is the morality quotient, which is very, very important. Right? Sometimes I would say more important than the EQ and the IQ, um, but you need all three. But the last is actually PQ, which is passion quotient. Right? I will not hire someone into a sustainability team in Tamasek if I do not detect the passion in that person, because you cannot give passion to somebody if it was absent there in the first place. It would be very difficult. Right. Um, I, right. So on <clears throat> um, that's one of the um, colors uh, of impact investing. Uh, it is actually a spectrum of colors. Right? Uh, you have uh, financial returns on one end, and you have intentionality of impact on the other. In other words, when you make a decision to invest in a particular project, the traditional thinking is nobody think in terms of what is the impact. Nobody put environmental impact or social impact as part of the equation for investing into a particular project. Right? And uh, this is prior to impact investing what, 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 as a concept uh, what, what, what was born, which is actually quite recently. Right? So, in that spectrum of things, you can imagine what might be a different calibration of the combination of the two. On one end, I can have just pure financial return, that's all I care. Then you move into financial return is paramount. But I will look for some impact, whether it's environment or social, as a secondary consideration. That's not bad, at least it's actually on your, on your, on your agenda. Or you then can move into look, I'm looking for impact intentionally, and it is as important as financial returns, but I'm not prepared to compromise on financial returns. You then narrow down your options of investable projects to a much narrower set. Then you move on to the other side of the equation. I'm prepared to put impact first. I'm looking for social impact, environment impact. That must come first. I have a methodology, I have a framework, and I have um, an ability
So this is where measurement as a science become very, very important, and is a very inchoate state of development, right? Because the accounting standard for financial returns is very well developed. You go to accountancy, you study in university, you get a degree, you become a professionally trained and qualified, you practice as an accountant. But the standards, the accounting rules for impact, so the social environment are not well defined as yet. There's no universal language, no universal standards. So many people are developing the, the standards and the metrics for that, but that is still a very much an evolving science and we are still at a very early, early stage of that. So in order to do that, you will find that not as many projects are as, in, as investable. And this is where blended finance comes into the picture. So if you have a particular project in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in India, and so on and so forth, where the particular project in terms of financing, you cannot apply the usual instruments and usual way of investing into the particular project, you may then have to blend loss leading capital or uh, high risk capital to growth capital, to patient capital together in a blended fashion so that the project can actually be financed. So these are some of the considerations that we have. Beth, the <clears throat> role of government, you touched on it in your opening comments. The role of government has been critical in bringing some very important, very difficult outcomes uh, to be achieved. Since we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing, that would be one example where government's support, uh, motivation, encouragement, uh, being a major buyer, a major source of funding for research, so when you take a look ahead, do you sense in your different travels that governments, and now I'll broaden it to institutions, are excited about, uh, want to be a part of some of these sustainable development goals that are behind us? I, I agree with your point that they're broad in nature, but is there something that you see people are rallying to uh, along this list that we can then try and think about how we can play a part in? I think that's probably the uh, greatest achievement in some way of the development goals is not only are they agreed to by 193 countries, but they provide that sort of moonshot quality, that mission-driven vision. Uh, this gets back to sort of the range of questions that have been asked that one needs to, around which to organize investment, uh, uh, human capital, uh, and innovation. I will say, and this is a little bit if I can also respond to the question that was given before, um, is I would distinguish just to, I've been thinking about this one as you've been talking, is I would distinguish between entrepreneurship and public entrepreneurship. And the public entrepreneur, who is the person in your organization who is excited about doing one of these things, has a somewhat different skill set they are somebody, so we know from Eric von Hippel since the 70s about user-led innovation and the path-breaking work that he's done to really show us what are the qualities of the entrepreneurial inventor, the person who is that individual has to break out of the corporate mindset to invent something for themselves. The public entrepreneur is somebody who doesn't care as much about whether it's their own idea. They're just really good at listening and looking and spotting and finding those good ideas wherever they may come from and again, connecting them back to these goals. And I think that's where, I think we see that in mission-driven organizations of all kind, but I think that's where government really has to play a role. And that requires a fundamental reskilling of how we think about what government does and what the role of the public servant is. This is not at all what government does today. Um, both because there's a real challenge in a lot of systems between what is the role of the public servant and are they really allowed to have a vision or are they just there to kind of execute a service. Um, that's one challenge. But the other is government institutions have been so closed for so long, worse than companies in terms of hierarchy, in terms of rules, in terms of structure, in terms of stifling creativity that we really have to have a fundamental transformation in terms of allowing people to go outside their silo, uh, whether it's 
within government or it's to the private sector or to the academic sector to look for the good ideas that are going to be solutions to these problems. So yes, I do think that's optimally what government can do best because it has the legitimizing and legitimate convening authority. Public institutions do, a UN organization, a government organization, a public mission-driven organization. Um, but that really requires that sort of mindset and skill set for collaborating across sectors. There's the view that says without a burning platform, which is a familiar concept in Singapore, right? Without a burning platform, it's hard to marshal the, the appropriate effort. Uh, if we stay with the lunar landing for the moment, the anxiety that the US was feeling about the Soviet Union at the time and Sputnik and no resource would be withheld because it was just that important. Somehow it's, when, you, when we say things like reduced inequality or this idea of uh, some of the SDGs don't inflame that same level of, of passion. Uh, is it possible for us to rally? Is the issue that we need to better understand what lays behind some of these? because it's also known that as soon as there was one or two more Apollo missions, it sort of everybody lost interest because in fact the man had landed on the moon and then it was sort of not as much of news after that. How do we continue to rally as people behind some actually very life-threatening and existential questions without this sort of burning platform? Well, yeah, um, I can try. Um, if you look at the 17 SDGs, and uh, you, you boils down to three or four different set of stakeholders that could make a difference. The policymakers is one. Um, not all policymakers around the world do the right thing, or they take a long-term view, and these are very long-term, uh, you know, challenges. Um, the consumers can make a difference uh, because if I demand sustainable products and services, and I'm prepared to perhaps even pay a premium for it, and the millennial does have some inclination towards that then that's a very powerful set of stakeholders. And the third, which I think, for me, the most important set of stakeholders will be the corporate world, uh, because the corporations exist to have suppliers, and supplier goes ultimately to resources. And I have consumers uh, who ultimately decide whether or not he or she wants my product, and I have distribution systems. So that entire value chain of business involves lots of people, lots of companies, all lots of suppliers, the supply chain, the distribution chain evolved. And if anyone and everyone in that particular value chain can do something about it, then potentially we can actually really achieve this. So in Tomase, we decided that in 17 SDG is very hard for people to grasp. Uh, because I even can't tell you what 17 SDG are. Uh, but we decided to make it a little bit simple. So we, we call it the ABC world. So A for active economy, now you find six of them for interactive economy. Then we call it B for beautiful society. Then we find another six of them for under beautiful society. And last but not least, we say clean earth. And uh, lo and behold, seven of them come under clean earth. But everybody can remember the ABC world, active economy, beautiful society, and clean earth, right? But if you think about it, why do all these 17 SDGs exist? And we bring it further down into, we think, three things that are really of existential threats for us today. One is climate. The second one is resources, because it's done enough of it. And the third is the global economy just, right? So that takes us to say, hey, can we build a climate reduction economy? Can we build a circular economy? And can we build a just economy? Marshalling the corporations from around the world, marshalling consumers, marshalling policymakers. If we can all do that, then there is hope for Paris Accord. <laughs> there is hope for climate change. There is hope for mankind. And uh, climate is exceedingly important because we, talk, we listened to the Prime Minister's uh, rally last night, and guess what? 25% of Singapore is going to be submerged to water. The world agriculture system is going to be ruined, and we will have problems with food supply. Um, Temperature rise will result in more tropical infectious diseases and public health will be bring to chaos. Uh, food supply is going to be ruined, right? And uh, so the, the consequences is devastating, right? Uh, resources are, are, are not uh, sustainable because the natural capitals are not being restored or protected. 
and uh, we have a blowing, a growing and uh, population of the world, and we just don't have enough food. How are we going to be able to do that? I mean, the problems are infinite, and uh, and and yes. So I hope that. But but, uh, and then I'm going to go back to the audience here for a second. But just stay with that for a second, Robin, because if you really want to push this concept, Sp Sputnik goes up in space. It's a physical. People can say, ah, right, the Russians are ahead. We don't want to lose. That, that's a response. When you say, by 2050, sea levels will be at a certain scenario, and as PM said, in some people's lifetime, that's going to be a reality. But that's still 30, right, 30 years away. So I'm just wanting to push the point, is there something, I mean, if we went out and we said, gosh, you know, East Coast Parkway is now a meter underwater, then it's real. But how do we think of some of these issues? And, and I'm not wanting to dwell on it too much, but these issues are much, much more existential than the space race was, and yet rallying to them seems to be a, a collective challenge for societies. You want to, you want to? You want to add to <laughs> I, I could, yeah. Okay, I can always. I'm a okay, I, I, I can always okay, I'll take <laughs> 20 seconds and I'll pass it back to you. Okay. Um, well, when I enter into the workforce that 37 years ago, um, I don't think climate or sustainability, the words were even invented. Um, 10 years ago, I don't think in the boardroom we discussed these matters either. I mean, in Singapore, I grew up from a generation of people who were, were just happy to have a decent life. And the conversation around dinner table was never about how sustainable the world economy was going to be, right? That just wasn't a conversation I had with my mom and dad and my grandparents. Um, five years ago, I didn't think the issue of sustainability was all that paramount in the conversation of the power corridors of the, of the corporate world. But I think that has changed tremendously, right? Uh, in the last five years and six years, I think there's great intensity. I think two defining moments came. UNSDG was one of them. Before that, the corporate world didn't have a common language to relate to. Uh, Paris COP21, I think, was yet another defining moment, because without that, without Christina Figueres, you know, there was no such conversation that we could have uh, as, in, as responsible and hopefully intelligent people around in the corporate world. We just didn't, right? Uh, uh, and so I, I feel that there, there is hope, right, with, with every a period of time that I think the intensity of the discussion has increased, that's number one. And number two, I think governments, governance are also not, uh, not taking action. Um, I think EU, for example, has quite a well-defined set of standards, and I think uh, you cannot invest uh, responsibly uh, out of the European capital today, these days, uh, particularly from the Sovereign Wealth Fund and responsible uh, capital owners uh, into projects that are not ESG compliant, for example. Uh, in Singapore, we have introduced carbon tax uh, as a form to uh, shape behavior of companies as well. It's only $5 for now, but the government did say that we increase it. Um, in increasingly, I, I see companies uh, are now doing sustainable, uh, sustainability reporting. Uh, we at Tomasek, as a steward, we encourage our portfolio company to do so as well. Uh, we have a very, um, we have a target to become carbon neutral ourselves as a firm. Um, so, uh, well, I, I think there are some positives uh, out there, uh, but uh, your point about is that enough, I think it's well taken, it's not enough. Bradley, you had a question you wanted to ask. Thanks for letting me jump back in. Um, back, so on this um, more hopeful note, um, so if the panel could maybe discuss, come up with some um, concrete ideas of how technology can be used to help developing world really leapfrog um, in their sustainable development. That would be interesting to talk about. Beth mentioned some approaches through collective intelligence, but maybe some actual technologies that might help leapfrog um, to help maybe motivate us and make us more hopeful. Thanks. Uh, I'll exercise the prerogative of the person holding the microphone. Uh, uh -oh. 
I will not answer that part. Um, I will start. <laughs> I mean, I can always answer it. It just will be wrong. Uh, so I would say on the specific, uh, so to, to, to respond to both of your points, I think to Steve's point, we know from behavioral economics that we need these kinds of, and from marketing, that we need these kinds of motivators. But that means we need to both, as a, uh, someone once said to me, um, and if I remembered whom, I would give them the credit, you have to look with a microscope and with a telescope at the same time, right? You need to be able to have both the big picture systems thinking view of these big vision goals, the big moonshot, but we need the really tactical things we can do, otherwise we throw up our hands in despair and go, oh well, underwater, what are you gonna do about it? Um, so it's the ability to marry the grand vision with the tactical, and to Bradley's question, I think what that means in terms of operationalizing some of this vision around collective intelligence, I would just go back to the IXC, the platform that is used, which is a set of methods that DFAT uses, but it's also a platform that they use. Challenge.gov in the United States is another example, again, um, these kinds of platforms that are used for organizing collective intelligence. If you look at what they're doing in Taiwan, the digital minister there has a program called VTaiwan. It uses four different tools, all of which are open source, but she's used them to organize over 200,000 people in a deliberative process for what's ultimately led to 26 pieces of national legislation. So they're trying to make law, not make investments, but they are trying to solve hard societal problems. And what they've done is said, we don't just need one tool. We don't just need a tool, an AI tool like a polis for understanding the views of a large number of people. We then need to marry that with some tools for open innovation, uh, and they use again another open source tool. We need to use a Slido type tool. So they have a collection of free and open source tools that they've put together into a process for essentially organizing collective wisdom. But I'll just say that I think that the future, the really interesting stuff in this space is at the intersection between artificial intelligence and collective intelligence. It's only with the machine learning applications that we're gonna be able to organize large scale collective intelligence in any meaningful way. So um, actually, it's, um, Mesuto is one of the biggest uh, focus is uh, leaping from innovation from developed market to emerging market. That's actually, we have seen the big impact because uh, most of the cases innovation is actually uh, need to change the regulation, for example, also need to change the rules. And then like Japan and US and developed countries, very hard. It takes years, sometimes you know, five years, 10 years and too late. Uh, versus emerging market, it's a left behind, but we see that's huge opportunity because maybe no rules, no regulation because uh, nothing over there, and also people need some solution immediately. That's why adaptation is so quick and then fast. And that's kind of leaping for innovation would happen with cross pollination and a cross geographic, you know, uh, coordination. That's why we try to, of course, you know, we are more uh, supporting startups, so I'm talking about more startup you know, aspect. Corporate aspect may be different, but when we do mentoring, we try to see, okay, you need to think about, you know, of course, sustainabilities and also more longer term success. And I try to raise their, you know, view more higher and then try to make a more leapfrog technology rather than extension. To be honest, if it is just extension, of course, nice to have, but impact is so small, nascent, and then at the end, return is very nascent, you know, almost no return. If it is a leaping frog technology, of course, maybe risky, but if it is successful, return will be huge. We have seen that. That's why we try to raise their view more higher and then bigger, and then, you know, vision will be more bigger. Then try to find the best place to deploy. Depend on the technology, right? If it is a healthcare, and it's better to go to India because India still healthcare regulation is good or bad, easy, than US. US is a very nightmare if FDA is sort of very tough and they need to go through tons of the process. And a startup could not sustain. That's why sometimes we, okay, you should go to India first. And in some cases, it's very successful. And drone company, we brought the uh, drone company to the Africa Rwanda. And now commercially deployed and bringing the broad pack by you know, autonomous uh, drone. It's a, maybe most advanced broad pack logistics system in the world right now. It happened within two years because of the, you know, the innovation. But if that startup stick with the US, and that's a US company, maybe 
it's okay, but there are lots of alternatives, you know, not necessary. In that case, the company value will be very small, and the return on investment is very small, of course. That's why I think uh, we try to create a sort of a platform which will allow cross-pollinations and also cross-geographic you know, adaptation um, between technology and also market. I think that activity is so important, and then of course in that sense, government and also UN will play a big role because it's not possible by private sector alone. It's very important to have a collaboration with the private and also public sectors to make it happen. Robin, let me just, in the interest of time, I'm going to try and ask a couple of very brief questions. There's a question specifically arrowing you, Robin. Um, how can corporations apply an understanding, a lens of innovation to have sustainability be seen as an important part of the ethos of a corporation as opposed to a cost center? Have you seen examples of corporations that have really uh, taken that to heart. I know your point about consumers and so on. Is, is it a simple question of it's the right leader within a corporation, or how do you look at this issue? Um, all that is true. Um, you will find that, um, that the leadership will have to come from the top. Uh, you have to walk the talk. Um, the boards, in particular, uh, has very good reasons from a governance standpoint to be paying serious attention to sustainability because the fiduciary duties of the board covers ESG uh, as a critical component of their responsibility. Uh, so in order for, them, for the board to discharge their responsibilities appropriately and comprehensively, there is no question uh, that ESG and sustainability is very much at the core of that, which explains why the SGX and many other uh, stock exchanges and uh, um, you know, financial regulators have mandated that sustainability reporting is mandatory uh, for publicly listed companies. And from that, you will see uh, how that uh, value system will also translate uh, into other companies uh, as well. Uh, so that's one. And number two, obviously, the leader uh, is, um, you know, the personal conviction and passion and dedication will permeate into the rest of the organization as well. And most of us will be familiar with uh, Unilever uh, as an organization that, uh, that promotes and propounds um, the, you know, the uh, sustainability. And they have a leader that, that, that lives and, and practice it every day. Uh, Paul Pullman, of course, uh, for those of us who are familiar with uh, his journey and his company. And it's not easy for him to do that. Uh, because you will have to go to the AGM and tell investors that if you don't like us, if you don't like sustainability at the core of our business, if you don't believe that it's the core value of the business, don't be our investors, don't be our shareholders. I mean, I wonder how many CEO will be able to put his, his job on the line to say that. So that takes boldness, conviction, passion, and self-confidence. Beth, uh, there's a question here that I think you're uniquely qualified to answer, which is this idea. Collective intelligence, and uh, the question is one, understand that collecting intelligence uh, around development is valuable. How do we think of this issue of, quote, ownership of the intellectual property that might accrue uh, from such uh, a collective intelligence? Oh, an interesting, an interesting question, and obviously one that is one of the core rules that has to be set in deciding how these marketplaces of ideas work. So there are many of them that are obviously about doing, you know, they're just about sharing and giving the TB example from India was, a, it was called the Open Source Drug Development Project. So it was about collective ownership and about nobody exercising ownership. And in fact, one of the things that those 8,000 people did was to write to the authors of the articles whose works were behind paywalls, whose works were subject to copyright, and to ask them to open them so they could share them. Now, obviously, that model uh, and let me give another more up-to-date model. My organization, the Governance Lab, runs a global network of data stewards. We are working with companies and governments around the world who are opening up their data. Often data, they have data that they collect that's not core to their business model, or sharing it in some way will not undermine whatever they're trying to sell soup and, soap and toothpaste, but they happen to have this data that may be really useful to UNDP in terms of understanding movements of human populations. Banks, 
mobile phone companies, satellite companies, consumer product companies in particular, are very eager now in many cases to share data, sometimes for limited purposes, sometimes under escrow, sometimes protected, sometimes openly, but in ways that will actually do public good. Um, very often because what they're trying to do is to maintain uh, and retain the passionate and motivated people who want to work on social good projects. Um, and that's a great way to retain talent is, you know, if they're otherwise writing insurance uh, uh, premiums or doing actuarial work by day. I'm a lawyer by training, so let me pick on the lawyers instead. Correcting commas on contracts by day, giving them an exciting pro bono project. So the sharing and the openness is often very key to these. However, that said, there are many of these marketplaces that do do things. For example, some of these competition platforms uh, will award a prize to the first winner uh, you know, the million dollar big prize, but then offer potentially there's a group of investors who are interested in monetizing the second and third place winners. Um, so there are lots of different arrangements I've seen for allowing people to share. Not everything has to be completely open. To share, to share their IP for a limited purpose, to still be able to get investment, to be able to get philanthropic investment, or again, to monetize uh, uh, their ideas in different ways. So it's just a question of how we set the rules uh, and what the right way is to do it, which may be different for different purposes. Okay, we're at the... <laughs> we're at the end of the time. What I'll do is, if it's a brief question. Thank you so much. And so I really appreciate to hear the panelists talk about technologies. And I myself were in the technology world for 20 years. Those names like IBM, Cisco Systems, and Microsoft. But unfortunately, when you're working in the field, you never heard about sustainability as a word. So that's the reality. Um, maybe probably this has changed maybe recently. And, and then I, I had reflection back, right, just my two cents, because sustainability is really an awareness. It's a conscious, it's a behavior. So rather than, I mean, it's good to use technology as a tool, but rather than focus on technology, it might be more a bigger impact we look at the media or social media. Because just an example, if we have the local newspaper to publish the carbon dioxide daily levels, people never heard about what is the level of carbon dioxide, what is healthy level, how does it change? And how about the eyes, I mean, the, the sea eyes, right? We never talk about it as part of the weather forecast. So when the awareness broadens, so when the people more awareness, the conscious of sustainability, that would drive the technology needs and adoption. Okay. So it wasn't a question, but I'll just take it as a statement, which is awareness, and the more awareness we can drive, the more concern and the more engagement, if I take it that way. I do need to try and leave time for us also to be able to chat. I'm gonna give last answer to Bradley because a question that was frequently asked is what are some specific ways that men and women in this room and not in this room can become involved in some of the work of the UNDP relating to some of these sustainable development goals? Are there ways in which those that have a passion and an interest have a, have a, have a vehicle to become involved? Um, if, if, if you're based here in Singapore, just come by and visit us and we'll come up with all sorts of ways in which you could be involved in, in this. Um, well, sure, certainly. Um, we've got, there's, we've got a, um, something called a, a youth collab that's coming up later this year, um, which I invite you all to get engaged with and we'll, we'll communicate on that. Um, certainly, in, and just more broadly, um, I think an excellent way is, is through all these um, different um, innovation labs across the developing world um, to, to link up with those um, as well, not just in Singapore, but from all over the globe. Um, that's maybe the best way to sort of, from, from the sort of ground up, really make change, I think. Yeah, thanks. So I think uh, a lot of awareness and interest, UNDP working on some very tough problems affecting the future of humanity. I think if you're not up to speed on some of these, please take a few minutes and educate yourself because behind each of these, back to Beth's earlier point, there's a number of specific points. For example, 16.9 is about a legal identity for everyone by 2030. Uh, we're running out of time considering we're almost at the end of 2019 and there's one to one and a half billion people that don't have a legal identity. But there are things that you can continue to unpack and unpack and unpack and part of Beth's earlier comments about taking a big problem and making it a series of identifiable 
uh, attackable problems that then you can engage a lot of different people in. So there's a lot behind each of these. Uh, Bradley, you have more? I, I'm sorry, sorry, Steve. I'm the worst uh, co-host, I know. Um, but the one more very specific thing, we'll be launching it um, very shortly in the next couple of months, um, a global innovation challenge around sustainable agriculture um, and agri-tech and the future of food coming out of Singapore, but really with a global remit um, that won't just be about an innovation challenge, but also curating and shepherding um, the winners and competitors in this from all over around the world. So urge you, especially those with interest in that space, to, to get involved in that. But we'll lo lots more about that later. And thanks, Steve, for all the Yeah, no, no, no. And, and also I'd like to add uh, one thing, because uh, why I'm here, right? Because um, I'm in Japan, right? And was in the US, India, then why I'm here? I think the role of the small country is so important, including Singapore, and also we are supporting Estonia as well. Estonia, as you know, quite advancing our e-government. Because, you know, small country can move quickly, regulation-wise, and also policy-wise, very quickly. And it's not possible done by Japan or US because I think there's a need to discuss maybe a two years, three years, four years, five years, and then nothing happened. But, you know, Singapore or Estonia, a small country can do that. And that's why, in order to move this kind of thing, Policy-wise, and you know, change the uh, support way of the corporate or st startup, it is possible done by Singapore. That's why actually we came over here. And then we believe Singapore can be the center place, especially Southeast Asia, because surrounded by emerging market. As I mentioned, we need to see leapfrog emerging market, and Singapore could be incubator and also I think a policy maker or concept maker to make a leapfrog happen in Southeast Asia country and also maybe India or, or China. And that, that's a big role. And then we are hoping that will be possible to happen. That's why we came up here two years ago. Then now actually I'm working with the uh, uh, JDC, uh, part of the uh, government agency, to create a next generation city design, which will include actually agriculture, farming, learning, and also logistics, and also uh, healthcare. All, almost all you know, uh, related uh, theme will be under new city design from their scratch. And then that's also uh, one of the reasons we came over here to work with the uh, Singapore government. And then hopefully some of the idea will be coming up tangibly and then that will be deployed to other emerging market and then actually create an actual tangible impact for this kind of agenda. So if we think about it within a few hours plane flight from Singapore, there's 650 million people. So we should never define the opportunity as being Singapore, but instead from Singapore that has a much greater impact. We have significant advantage in education and in scientific research and in investment capital through lots of important leaders such as Tomasic and others. So there's plenty of assets. It's just how we utilize those assets, which is back to this concept of mindset. But I think based on the fact that there's so many people here and so much engagement, and I apologize to those whose questions on Slido I couldn't get to, thank you for being a part of it, and we'd love to continue the dialogue with you online or offline. Thanks for being here.